Today we continue in our study in the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 11, and we're looking at God's continual witness in the tribulation. We want to read these 19 verses of Revelation 11, but before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. That you're more than fair and more than just in your dealings with men. That it's not one or two or three chances that you give men to be saved. But your long suffering and your hands are outstretched towards the world. And you're patient. You know our frame. You know our weaknesses. You know the problems that we face. You know our inabilities. Your witness is thorough and faithful and complete. So we will never have an excuse. We will never be able to say we did not know. We could not have known. We could not do what you asked us to do. Lord, in view of our great light and our great privilege, we pray that we may see our great responsibility. That we may cease from carelessly and foolishly living the Christian life. That we may not walk in the pride of ourselves and our accomplishments. But may we trust and look and rejoice in the person of your Son and his work in our behalf. And we see that work being completed in the book of the Revelation. And we see your witness, your attempt to reach men, and you will reach many of them, and many of them will see and be willing to even give their physical lives that they might be saved. Lord, may we see today, we pray. For we ask it in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And there was given to me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship in it, and the court which is outside the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the nations and the holy city shall be trod down underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the lampstands standing before God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecies, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the pit, bottomless pit, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city Sodom, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, uh, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and the kindreds and the tongues and the nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half uh, days and shall not permit their dead bodies to be put in the graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life came from God and entered into them and they stood on their feet in great fear fell upon 
them who saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain seven thousand, and the remnant were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world is become the kingdoms of our Lord and our, his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their thrones fell down on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and his reign. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them who destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Covenant, and there was lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Do you like to figure out great mysteries? All the clues are there, you know, and you just have to see them and put them all together and the puzzle falls into place and then you know the secret. God's testimony is no secret. It's no mystery. There are mysteries in it, I know. Things that men have not understood, but God's testimony is clear and open and repeated and often. We have His Word. We have men who preach His Word today. We have His church, the workers that do His Word. We are lights and testimonies in this world. We're supposed to be. God has testimonies. He has witness. He has power. He has revealing. And you know that the, the false prophet is going to be able to pull fire down from uh, heaven, from the skies, and, and burn up uh, parts of cities and towns in demonstration of his power during the tribulation while well, these witnesses are going to be able to demonstrate the true power and just as in Moses in the plagues of Egypt God had a demonstration of his power and Satan tried to counterfeit that and say we can do that too and so we have this struggle between the God of this world Satan and the God of all the universe and the God of heaven the Lord Jesus and His Father and the Spirit. And so we have His witness during the trib and God's witness is clear. And God's witness is repeated and God's witness is constant in the tribulational period. And we see it here today. And so we say we must see God's continual witness in the tribulational period. And how can we do that in chapter 11 of Revelation? How can we see God's witness and His truth and His demonstration before the world? And we know that He has 144,000 witnesses that are going to do it at the beginning of the trib. And the book has told us about that. And we know that He'll send signs and wonders and to the earth that men might know something is happening. Some great event is occurring. And He'll make men realize the truth of his existence and the necessity of turning to him in salvation. His witness is continual and we see it here in chapter 11. And how can we do that? Well, we need to see the place of his witness in 1 and 2. Now there have been a lot of temples in, in Israel and they're trying to reveal one now. And, and there's a problem because the, the air of, of moss, the dome of the rock, sits on the place where the temple is supposed to be. And friend, the temple in 1 and 2 here, I believe, as scholars do, is the temple that will be built under the direction of the Antichrist and his 
ten Confederate uh, European nation power base. He will broker a peace between Israel and the Arabs, and this will begin the tribulation period. It is the false peace and the false covenant of hell that's referred to in the Old Testament. But it will begin the time and the clock ticking of this seven-year period in which God will wrap up all his plans for eternity and history and earth and mankind. But this false covenant will be made and one writer suggested properly so that one provision the Jews would want secured in that covenant is that they could rebuild their temple and proceed with their worship and their religion. And they've not been able to do that, friend, since the temple's been destroyed. And there are many things that would have to be straightened out for them to do that. But the, above all else, they need a temple. And of course, they will perhaps, some of them, not worship the God of heaven, but will receive and believe in the Antichrist that he is their God and he will pollute uh, the temple by going into it in the middle of the tribulational period and proclaiming that he is their Messiah and their God. But we see the place of the witness here and the time of the occupation of the Gentiles in the holy city the place is the temple, and the temple's in Jerusalem. And obviously that's the place that it's talking about here. And it, it in verse uh, 8, we see for sure that because it's the place where Jesus was crucified. And so the city is the, and the temple that he's talking about here is the place around which these two prophets finish their ministry of witness on the earth. Now, I... I Evidently, on the basis of verse 3, they started at the beginning of the tribulation and, and that they probably go up to about the middle of the tribulation before these events occur. They've been at this thing of witnessing and demonstrating the power of the God of heaven and earth and his message for the trip. And they've been very effective and people have hated them that would not believe in the message. But they're here in Jerusalem, and we see them here. Well, we look at the place of God's witness and understand about why, how and why and when God will witness in the tree. We look at the two witnesses in 3 through 9. We see the witnesses themselves. And, of course, the Antichrist will fight against them and will kill them in Jerusalem. And, and they will leave their bodies in the streets. And because we live in a small world today, and this will be news in the world, the television cameras will be that, and the news reports will be there, and they're going to purposely leave their bodies on, in the streets to demonstrate that they've been defeated and they won't bury them right away. And it will be a thing of rejoicing. And the world will rejoice at it. And they will make merry and send each other presents. Because uh, these men that, uh, that have uh, so plagued the earth with the words and message of God have been destroyed. And who are these two witnesses? Well, some think that they're unnamed because they're men that will just be in the future who will be witnesses for God. But the context here and the reference to the two lampstands that we find in the Old Testament passage of Scripture, God's particular chosen from the Old Testament Scripture looking forward to these events in the new. These witnesses here, my witnesses, indicates in the context that God uh, has chosen them and known them and they have been witnessing uh, in the past for him and because of what they can do and their ministries and we know for, for sure if they are characters out of the past that one of them for certainly is Elijah because it is prophesied very strongly that Elijah personally would come before the uh, uh, 
the, the end of things in the day of the Lord. And it, the scripture makes it clear that though John the Baptist came in the power and likeness of Elijah's ministry, that he wasn't Elijah. Uh, <clears throat> but Elijah must come. And Christ validated that idea too. And we believe that Elijah, I believe that these witnesses are not men in the future, but there are men that come out of the past, and certainly Elijah would be one of them. He is said to be, and Elijah never died physically, friend. Now some think that Moses will be the other because he represents the law and because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration discussing the end time events with Elijah and Christ. But there are a couple problems with Moses, one of which Moses died. And what about the scripture that says it's appointed to man once to die? Would Moses die twice? And there are things, and one writer points out that these witnesses not only witness to Jewish people, but they witness to the whole world. And God's salvation is involved in saving the whole tribulational world, both Jew and Gentile. Of course, Jews will be his messengers and his witness, and it is a Jewish book, and much will revert back to the Old Testament. But the salvation offer is to all men in the tribulational period, and and this will be, uh, and this could be accomplished by a person like Enoch that witnessed and lived in a, a antediluvian before the flood time, before Abraham and the giving of the law, and the people of Israel were established. And Enoch, too, never saw death. You remember, Enoch was not, and God took him. And so I believe that if these prophets are from the past, that they are Elijah and Enoch. But they are witnesses, and they are men, and they will be killed, and they will lay in the street, and God will resurrect them and call them up into heaven. And all the world will see it. What a marvelous testimony to the work and the power and the message of God these two men will be. And then if we're going to see God's continual witness in the tribulational period, we need to see the scope of their witness. The scope of their witness. And we see this and we've alluded to it here. They witnessed to the people that were in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the Jews, the center of the Jewish faith. And so their witness was a witness to the Jewish people. And the Jews saw them killed. And we have the scripture here about the earthquake that happens in verse 13. There was a great earthquake and and. 7,000 people were killed after these two witnesses were, were brought up into heaven and there was destruction in the city of Jerusalem everywhere. And that is the event that will allow the remnant to escape from Jerusalem and go down into the wilderness. And, but the remnant was terrified and feared the believing remnant of the Jews and gave honor and glory to the God of heaven. It was a witness to the Jewish people, 10 through 19. And it was a witness to the whole earth. Everyone saw it because the, the, the TV cameras will be there and all the world will see it and, and things will be focusing upon what happens in Jerusalem because that's where the Antichrist is in the temple claiming to be God. And there will be a focus upon that place. And all the world is going to see these people that were slain and then see them resurrected and caught up to glory in the sky. So the witnesses to the Jewish people of Jerusalem, the witnesses to the whole world, and the witness even goes to the regions of heaven. And we see in 15 through 19 that the angel sounded in heaven after these witnesses had been caught up into heaven. And the proclamation is made that the kingdom of this world uh, uh, are have become, they're, they're in the process of becoming in a short period of time. They're becoming the, and be turned over to the reign and the authority of Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And that they fell down and worshiped God and worshiped the Lamb. 
And notice in verse 18, the, the nations are angry. Why do the people rage, Psalm 2? The nations are angry. And the angry, rebellious nation, people of this earth in the trail because of their sin and their refusal to trust God and receive His righteousness. That anger is going to culminate as Satan takes the demons and, and organizes the armies of the earth and brings them all together. And Originally they fight each other and then they unite together as the darkness covers the earth and the light of the presence of the glory of God is coming in the sky. They unite together and decide to fight the Christ that's coming in the air. The witness. The witness. The witness of God on earth even carried over to the praise and the worship and the conversation of heaven and the opening of the temple and the revealing of the ark and the presence and the promise of God to Israel and to this world. We end up, don't go to hell because they can't know the way. They go to hell because they refuse to listen to the way. They refuse to hear God's warning. They refuse to listen to the conscience that God has put into their heart and their life. They refuse to study and believe and hear the Word of God and its claims. They refuse to think about the Lord of glory dying for them on the cross. They refuse to think about their own death and their future and eternity and what happens after I die here on this earth and my life is ended. What about judgment and what about God? They refuse to think about a creator and to allow that into their thinking and so they develop this wild and crazy system of evolution which is ridiculous but which is the only alternative to believing that there is a creator and a God. And men refuse. But God's witness is everywhere. It's in creation. It will be in the sky. It will be in the, uh, the His Word. People will have Bibles during the tribulational period. Though Satan will hate them. And, and people will be witnesses of the Word of God in the tribulational period. Preachers carrying the Gospel. Their intensive ministry throughout all the earth in that seven year period. And God will have these two special witnesses that we see in chapter 11. Who will have the power and the majesty of God and do miracles. And preach and proclaim men's needs of salvation and be resurrected upon their deaths and caught up into glory and all men watching them and see God as a continual witness. Well, that's then. Well, what about now? And what about you and me? And I say again, we will stand before God without an excuse. We have His Word and we have His salvation if we're His children today. And we have His life living within us and we have the Holy Spirit and the person of Christ. We have prayer. We have every available means and witness to understand and do what God wants us to do. And the burden of my heart is that the young people and the old people and the rich and the poor of this earth have no desire to learn and find this word. We are turning from it. We are neglecting of it. We are so satisfied in living for things, in living for time, in living for ourselves. What a great error. What a great mistake it is. What a great waste of the message and provision and salvation of our God. It need not be so. And one reason it need not be so, and it may not be so, and I trust it is not so in you and me, is because of God's continual witness to our lives. His name be praised forevermore. Amen.